So my name is uh, Amish Tave. I'm one of the EPs also at Methodist. Um, we're going to talk about bradyarrhythmias and pacemakers. And uh, so anyone who's looked at the alphabet soup of VVI modes, DDI modes, DDD modes is probably going to um, dread this a little bit. We'll try to really stick to very fundamental things. Briefly, and this is, this is too simple for, for um, everyone here, any um, Brady arrhythmia can be broken down into sort of the site of the problem in the conduction system. Uh, the problem very commonly is in the sinus node. Uh, you get sick sinus syndrome uh, causing bradycardia very, very frequently. Uh, the problem can be at the level of the AV node from AV nodal blocking agents or from diseases. Um, and then infranodal uh, disease uh, can cause bradycardia. Uh, patients with um, uh, left bundle who then develop damage to the right bundle can get heart block and complete heart block in MOBITS too. So um, the treatments for bradycardia are, are fairly simple. Stop whatever is doing it, and if you can't stop whatever is doing it, it's a pacemaker for the most part. So uh, pacemakers and, and um, uh, these are actually defibrillators, but pa the, the pacemaker devices come in lots of shapes and sizes. They come in versions that have one leads, two leads, three leads, no leads. Um, they have leads, usually, and the leads have uh, one electrode or two electrodes or, or, or four electrodes for LV. The uh, pacemakers are really, really simple at their fundamental basic level. They do only two things. They will pace and they will sense. Um, the complexities arise when you're adding chambers and, and you're pacing and sensing in each of them and how they interact. But at the basic level, they pace and they sense, so pacing. In order to make uh, cardiomyocytes uh, depolarize and, and start uh, uh, mechanical systole, you have to enter phase zero of the action potential. If you remember the phases of the action potential uh, and the action potential um, uh, voltage as a, as a time plot, there's a very sharp um, there's a very sharp onset to the depolarization that happens when sodium channels open. These sodium channels are voltage sensitive. You have to depolarize the cell a little bit from its negative resting membrane potential to get that QRS or, or P wave to start. And uh, that's what pacemakers do. By releasing a certain amount of current into the, uh, the tissue, you, uh, you can hopefully cause enough cardiomyocytes to cross the threshold to begin this. The amount of power it takes to do that uh, is different from patient to patient, from lead to lead, and, and, and sometimes uh, there'll be some fluctuations even day to day, and medicines will change it and whatnot. Basically, when, it, when you're uh, looking at these pacemakers uh, in, the, in the lab, uh, I think tomorrow, you're going to see that one of the very important things to do anytime you check a device uh, is to check the capture threshold for any uh, particular lead. So. With any lead, you're going to wind up having a, it generate a square wave. You're going to generate a certain amount of voltage for a certain duration. Uh, if you use 100 volts, you're going to get a, a, an action potential in anything. If you use a, a fraction of, uh, of a microvolt, you won't get any action potential in anything. Um, and if the duration is too short, you won't get any, any action potential. And if it's very long, it becomes easier to get an action potential. And there's usually an optimum that EPs can, uh, can uh, calculate uh, if they're studying for the boards. And, and uh, this uh, optimum is where you get the least current drain on the battery. Um, so atrial capture and ventricular capture. This is going to show atrial capture. You can see uh, pacing spikes. Pacing spikes are easy to see when you have uh, uh, maybe epicardially placed uh, pacer wires or a floating temp wire when you're usually using lots of power uh, and the electrodes that you're pacing from, the positive and negative end, are, are maybe far apart. Um, and in older pacemakers, uh, every lead had one electrode on it, so the positive was that, and the negative was, was over here in the, in the can. So in the textbooks, all the, all the EKGs had massive pacing spikes. But in the real world nowadays, you're not going to see such big pacing spikes because uh, the positive and negative electrodes are very close to each other. We're not throwing that much current uh, with implanted pacemakers. And um, so you have to look for them. But you can see over here, there's a pacing spike followed by a P wave, pacing spike followed by a P wave, et cetera. Uh, 
Um, and that's atrial capture. Ventricular capture, yeah, every pacing spike should be followed by a QRS. Ventricular loss of capture, you can see um, that in this case, you see pacing spikes marching through a little faster than 60 beats per minute. Um, 60 beats per minute would be five boxes, and this is around 75 beats per minute or, or, or faster. And not one of them has either a P wave or a QRS following it. And so this is um, uh, a situation where either the lead is floating or we're, we're programmed to uh, output too small of a uh, pacing spike. So uh, this is another situation which is sort of very dangerous and very important to recognize. If you see a patient's telemetry strip and you see pacing spikes followed by QRSs, and you know from this interval that this pacemaker should have fired over here, um, it doesn't ever decide not to do that uh, unless there's a problem. And so here, there, what, there, sh there is no pacing spike. Uh, there should have been one, and that's actually a real hardware problem in the pacemaker. That, that, that patient seems dependent, and this is worrisome, and, and it needs to be fixed right away. Fusion beats um, are, are beats where uh, there's activation of the ventricle or the, or the atrium from a normal sinus P wave or, or AV nodal uh, generated QRS and part of the ventricle or, or atrium is captured by the pacing spike. So both at the same time. How do you know there's fusion in this beat? You see that there's a pacing spike and a wide QRS over here. That's a fully paced beat. And then over here, this patient obviously has AFib, and you can see some conducted complexes that are narrow. These are, uh, are, are much narrower than the pacing uh, pace beats. And then here you see a pacemaker spike followed by a QRS that's somewhere halfway between the pace um, QRS and the narrow beat. That's a fusion beat. So I said pace, pacemakers do only two things. Uh, there's not much more to say about pacing. Uh, but sensing is just as important. Pacemakers are programmed to have um, certain sensitivity thresholds, and when you're seeing a patient uh, on, on the wards or on, on the unit, and there's a problem with, uh, with their pacemaker uh, on telemetry, um, it's also very likely that it could be with uh, a problem with sensitivity. The pacemaker is going to be recording intrinsic signals produced by the atrium or ventricle at the tip of the electrode that, it, that it's, uh, that's going to vary from patient to patient and time to time and situation to situation. If, uh, if you have a, a you know, 100 millivolt signal or 25 millivolt signal more realistically, you're, it's not a challenge to detect that. But if it's a lot smaller than that, there's um, a threshold setting on, on any pacemaker the voltage has to cross that threshold in order for the pacemaker to recognize that a heartbeat has happened. And that setting can be adjusted and changed up and down. If it's lowered too low, it can start picking up more easily noise and, and external signals, the microwave oven, et cetera. And if it's set too high, then it may fail to recognize that um, an intrinsic uh, QRS or P wave has happened. So here, um, this is normal function of a device that's sensing appropriately. Here you can see that there's a, an atrial pacemaker with a pacing spike here followed by a P wave and a conducted QRS. Another pacing spike here. So that tells you that the pacemaker is programmed to wait this long, the pacing interval, before giving uh, uh, atrial pacing uh, spikes. Now here, there was a sin probably a sinus P wave that kicked in, and it came in before the next regularly scheduled uh, atrial pacing spike. And you can see that the next pacing spike was reset uh, from the beginning. If you take this interval and you keep it the same, it's, it w the presence and detection of that P wave reset the pacemaker's clock, and it waited the same pacing interval from this P wave before uh, pacing over here. That can only happen if you're uh, adequately um, sensing. And if you're not adequately, well, okay, and then, and then in the ventricle, uh, same thing. Basically, this patient has a ventricular pacemaker that paced uh, uh, over here, then there was a, a narrow QRS over here, and that reset the pacing interval uh, timer, and then it paced over here again. 
when you oversense, that leads to underpacing. Um, so if a patient is not producing pacing spikes where they're supposed to be producing pacing spikes, that's very often usually from oversensing. It thinks that the patient has their own QRS. This is the problem where if a patient has a device and you don't put a magnet on it and they get surgery and the surgeon starts using bovi uh, cautery near the, the pacemaker, the electrical signals produced by the cautery trick the pacemaker into thinking that the patient has a very fast uh, rhythm and so it's not going to pace into that. In this patient, there should have been, you know that from this, the timing in between this pacing spike and this one, there's uh, an expectation that there should have been a pacing spike over here, or there was a sensed event. It thought there was a signal over here that really isn't there, uh, and that happens throughout the tracing. This uh, patient's uh, ventricular lead is sensing noise, and that's a problem. Undersensing uh, leads to overpacing. Uh, so over-sensing, if you're sensing too much uh, 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 signals that shouldn't be there, you inhibit pacing usually and you, you have too, uh, too little pacing. If you're not sensing signals that you should, that usually leads to uh, too much pacing, a failure to inhibit. Here there's a, a, narrow, a narrow QRS that should not be followed by a pacing spike, but is, and that's because the pacemaker did not recognize uh, the presence of this QRS. So the, sensitivity on the uh, ventricular lead uh, at a minimum probably needs to be adjusted. Um, there's not a problem with capture here. So you could look at this and say, there's a pacing spike, but there's no QRS afterwards. W why is that not a failure to capture? The problem here is these beats all capture just fine. These two did not, but they're not capturing because they're pacing in the middle of ventricular systole. So the uh, NASPY uh, codes for pacemaker program, uh, programming um, really can look very complicated or you can look at it as fairly simple. The first letter is always the chamber you're pacing. Uh, it can be A, V, or D. A means you're pacing in the atrium, V is ventricle, and D means you, the, the device has the ability to pace both and it's programmed to pace both. And if it's programmed to DOO, uh, that really means all you're doing is you're pacing, you're not sensing, you're just putting out spikes at some pre-programmed interval. If you have a, a letter uh, in the second uh, um, position that's not O, O means no, no sensing or no pacing. If it's A, that means you're sensing in the atrium and usually using that to trigger pacing in the ventricle. Uh, or sensing in the ventricle and using that to inhibit pacing in the ventricle. And the third letter can be, uh, usually is gonna be I or D. Um, so if you are DDD mode, that means you're gonna sense in both chambers. If you sense a P wave, you're gonna look to pace in the ventricle to follow it to maintain AV synchrony. If you sense a QRS, you're gonna inhibit pacing because you don't wanna do that. Um, so you're sensing and pacing in both chambers. VVI mode uh, means you don't, pay attention to anything in the atrium, whether you have a lead or not, and all you're doing is pace in the ventricle at whatever rate is programmed to, unless you sense a QRS. You're gonna sense a QRS. And then VOO mode is if, uh, you know, if you have a box and you're worried about noise, you're worried about bovi electrocautery, you set their pacemaker to VOO mode, it will just shut its eyes and just put out pacing spikes. It doesn't care if there's electrocautery, it doesn't care if there's intrinsic QRS complexes, et cetera. And those are the three common modes. So with that, I'm going to stop. Um, these are some new pacemakers. This one is clinically available now, and this one is experimental, basically a watch mechanism um, turned into a, a self-regenerating pacemaker, and this is a, uh, and a totally implantable um, uh, leadless pacemaker that's appropriate for people who don't need AV synchrony, maybe because they have chronic atrial fibrillation, and also probably are, are not good candidates for having leads.